Hello there, fellow med students. My name's Goldie, and if you're anything like me, you spend far too much time on YouTube looking for educational videos so you don't actually have to study. Well, look no further. After wasting countless hours searching and procrastinating, I've come to the conclusion that there is actually nothing on YouTube that is going to help me study for med. So in order to remedy this, I decided to make my own educational videos. Now this is just a work in progress thing. I'm using just the camera on my computer uh, and the mic on my computer and production values are very low. But bear with me and we'll see what we can do. To kick things off, I'm going to start with the kidneys. Now I know this is a little bit sadistic because nobody actually understands the kidneys. But let's give it a go and hopefully by the end of it we know a little bit more than the fact that there are two kidneys and they're both kidney shaped. Before we begin, I'd ask that you just familiarize yourself with the anatomy of the nephron and the anatomy of the kidney for that matter. Uh, just using a basic physiology textbook, just become familiar with terms such as the afferent arteriole, the efferent arteriole, glomerulus, uh, Bowman's capsule, uh, the various parts of the nephron including the macula densa, etc. It'll just make things a little bit easier. So we're talking about the kidneys. Those reasonably important organs that sit there filtering the blood. They remove all the waste products and they make sure we retain anything that's vital like glucose and proteins. As such, a substantial amount of blood flows through the kidneys. About 20% of the cardiac output, which is about one litre of blood flowing through both kidneys every minute. Wow! A litre per minute? That's, that's, that's like, that's a lot. That's like 1,440 litres a day. Little castle reference there. Needless to say, it's an important organ. So where's all this blood go? Well, it enters the kidney via the renal artery, but it's got to make its way to the nephron, the functional unit of the kidney. This is where filtration, reabsorption, and secretion occurs to make the end product, urine. So the blood makes its way into this functional unit via the afferent arteriole, which divides into a capillary bed known as the glomerulus. Glo 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 glomerulus. Try saying that ten times quickly. But I digress. Glomerular capillaries are leaky, and this facilitates filtration of solute into Bowman's capsule, which is the beginning of the nephron tubules. So we've got blood in through the afferent arterioles, they enter the filtration unit, which is the glomerulus, and then they got to go somewhere. So the blood exits this capillary bed through the efferent arteriole. The afferent and efferent arterioles are important because, as we shall discuss later, they are what help control the rate at which the solute is filtered. Alright, let's flesh out filtration a little bit. The driving force behind glomerular filtration is what's called hydrostatic pressure. This essentially means that there's more fluid and therefore a greater pressure in the glomerular capillaries than there is in Bowman's capsule. Now because the capillaries are leaky, fluid is forced from the high pressure system, which is the capillaries themselves, into the low pressure system, which is the Bowman's capsule. But wait, if these blood vessels are leaky and fluid just keeps leaking out of them, what stops too much fluid from leaking out of them? Intelligent design to the rescue. That hydrostatic pressure that promotes filtration is opposed by oncotic pressure, which attempts to keep fluid inside the capillary. Naturally, as solute is filtered into Bowman's capsule, we get an increase in protein concentration within the capillary. Thus, the oncotic pressure rises along the length of the capillary, opposing filtration, until the driving force of filtration reaches zero, just before the efferent arteriole. Thus, filtration happens up until a point without removing too much fluid from the blood. This is about 20% of the renal plasma flow. So given that glomerular filtration is related to renal blood flow, and renal blood flow is related to blood pressure, there must be a way for the kidneys to maintain a steady glomerular filtration rate across all the possible physiological blood pressures. Otherwise, every time our blood pressure went up, such as when we ride up a flight of stairs, our kidneys would fill up with fluid and explode. And, surprise, surprise, there is. Renal blood flow is controlled by autoregulation, which is the result of three factors that modulate both afferent and efferent arteriolar tone. If we remember that the afferent arteriole is the small artery through which blood enters the glomerulus and the efferent arteriole is the one through which it exits, we can see that constricting or dilating these arterioles controls the blood flow through the glomerulus and therefore has an impact on the filtration rate. And just what are those three factors? I thought you'd never ask. They are, they are, what are they? They are autonomous vasoreactive or myogenic reflex of the afferent arterioles, tubular glomerular feedback, and angiotensin II modulated vasoconstriction of the efferent arterioles. That took too many takes. But first things first, 
autonomous vasoreactive or myogenic reflex of the afferent arterioles. This is essentially the first line of defense against fluctuations in renal blood flow. As the name states, this is a reflex. The afferent arterioles reflexively vasoconstrict in response to an increased renal blood flow. This prevents any unnecessary increase in glomerular filtration rate. Similarly, the opposite can happen. If there is a significant reduction in renal blood flow, the afferent arterioles can vasodilate in order to let as much blood into the glomerulus as possible to maintain a functional glomerular filtration rate. Factor number two, tubular glomerular feedback. This is essentially maintenance of the glomerular filtration rate based on what's happening within the tubule of the nephron itself. This feedback is mediated by the macula densa, which is a specialized collection of cells located in the thick ascending loop of Henle. They sense solute concentration and the flow of fluid within the tubule. If there is high tubular flow due to increased filtration, there will be an increased delivery of solutes to the macula densa, which cause vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole in an attempt to reduce glomerular filtration. Cells of the macula densa cause this vasoconstriction of the afferent arterioles by producing increasing amounts of ATP. This is produced in excess due to the increased uh, reabsorption of sodium chloride. ATP is metabolized in the extracellular space into adenosine, which is a very potent vasoconstrictor. <sighs> you can't tell I'm getting tired. But it works the other way. During times of reduced flow and therefore reduced delivery of solutes to the macula densa, the macula densa doesn't absorb as much sodium chloride and therefore doesn't produce as much ATP. Thus, there's not as much adenosine around to vasoconstrict the afferent arterioles and they're able to vasodilate in order to increase the uh, glomerular filtration rate. Just as a side note, this is where loop diuretics act. They block sodium chloride uh, reabsorption by the macula densa and therefore block this feedback uh, and allow a much greater uh, filtration rate, resulting in diuresis. And now the third factor. Ha ha ha, I'm nearly finished. Angiotensin II modulated vasoconstriction. This system is activated in states of reduced renal blood flow, such as volume depletion. Granular cells in the afferent arteriolar walls, in a region called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, secrete renin. Renin is a proteolytic enzyme that converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin I. Angiotensin I is then converted to angiotensin II by angiotensin converting enzyme. Clever, yeah? Angiotensin II stimulates vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole. This raises hydrostatic pressure within the glomerulus and returns glomerular filtration back to a normal level. Woohoo! You did it! So today we talked about the anatomy of the filtration apparatus of the nephron, which includes the afferent and efferent arterioles, the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. We talked about the physiology of filtration and the pressures that drive filtration. And we also talked about mechanisms by which the kidney can maintain an appropriate glomerular filtration rate. Got it? Got it? Good. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just really tired. So there you go. The physiology of filtration in the nephron. This was my first YouTube video ever, so please leave some comments in the comment section below. Hope you found it useful, and we'll see you next time when we discuss secretion and reabsorption in the kidney. See ya.